consult before Western Sydney University. I'm trying to I try to communicate the science that the researchers um, feed me. Basically, at, for this program, I'm getting told information earlier than it would be published, so that I can hopefully try and share it with you. There hasn't been a lot of research done yet because of the two, uh, the two PhD students we've got here today, this is their first year, so they'll tell you about what they're doing. But that's the plan is that I will communicate the progress of the project to, to the greater public um, in the, in the, that are involved in the project. Otherwise, I, I just try and tell communities, well, um, the wider community about the importance of native bees, about pollination, crop production um, and biodiversity. So today I'm going to talk about pollination and we're going to talk about why pollinators are really important and why we shouldn't be relying solely on honeybees. Um, I'll talk about the other potential pollinators including stingless bees and solitary bees and I'll talk about how we can support them by planting native and non-native plants and then I'll, the, um, our researchers will come have a chat with you, uh, the three of them will present their work and then I think we'll have a break and go for a walk as Kate said. So I know most of you are going to go but I know what pollination is. So, but we're all going to be on the same page today and I'm going to get right down into the nitty gritty of what pollination is. So pollination is the transfer of pollen, these little dudes. They have got the male sex cells in them, the male gametes are kept, are, are contained within those pollen grains. And they are held and produced on the anther of the plant, of the flower. So these, these grains, thousands and thousands of them, have to be transferred to the stigmatic surface. So this is part of the female reproductive part of the flower. So in order for this to get transferred to here, something needs to help it out, and that's a pollination vector. So that can be water, wind, or an animal. So it needs to go onto this stigmatic surface, and you'll see it's a little bit shiny, that's a sugary secretion. The sugar will then, when the pollen lands on that, it will nurture or nourish the pollen grain and the pollen grain will then germinate. So underneath this sugary syrup are these papillae. They're long, fingery projections that will hold the pollen when it lands on the stigmatic surface. Thousands and thousands of pollen grains are, in, are contained in this area here. So here we have those pollen grains held tightly amongst those papillae. This is a pollen grain and it started to germinate. So this is the pollen tube and this is a pollen tube that's grown and as it grows, it moves down, grows down the pistil of the female reproductive part. And as it grows, this long tube, it drags the male gametes with it. So the insect lands on the flower, the pollen germinates, the, po the pollen, pollen tube grows down this, the pistil and the male gametes are united with the female gametes in the, ov in the ovule. So pollination then leads to fertilisation. Fertilisation then leads to seed development. And when we get seed development, the seeds produce a, a plant hormone that stimulates fruit tissue growth. So in summary, no, not that one. Pollen grains deposited, germinating, carrying the gametes down to be united and fertilises the ovule. So that's pollination. So here we have a stingless bee on a cucumber. Once it's pollinated, then the seeds, the ovules start to develop into seeds. And when there's good seed development, you'll get good 
root tissue growth. These seeds weren't overly well pollinated, uh, developed, so they're not, it's a little bit dodgy. So the more ovules that you have in a fruit, the more pollen needs to be deposited on the stigma. The more visits you need to have from, from, uh, from insect pollinators. So it's not just enough for a bee to land on a flower once. Some that have got lots and lots of ovules need to be uh, pollinated several times by several bees and lots of pollen grains. Here we have um, a tomato. This has been well pollinated, so you've got really well developed seeds and the fruit tissue has, has been stimulated and growing and this gel has also um, has filled the whole fruit out and it's a much better flavour as well. Well pollinated fruit has a much better flavour. This is a puffy tomato, they call it. The seeds haven't developed. They haven't been pollinated. This hasn't been pollinated properly. And although you get a fruit, it's lighter, it's empty, it's tasteless, and it's dry. Same with cucumber. This is a well-pollinated cucumber. Here the seeds have developed, the fruit has started to develop, and this has not. Zucchini will abort. Um, a watermelon, we've got a few seeds here, so therefore fruit tissue development, but a poor, low quality, you couldn't sell at market. And with macadamia and avocado, it's a matter of as many flowers being pollinated will give you a large, high quality yield. And so it's not so much fruit misshapenness, it's the fact that if it's not pollinated properly, if it's not a good quality pollination, that nut or uh, fruit will drop off. So what is a pollinator? So about 125 million years ago, there were some wasps who were hunters, they're meat eaters. They decided, no, I'm a bit sick of this hunting business, it's a really hard work chasing after bugs and trying to provide for the family. So they started to evolve with the newly developing um, angiosperms 125 million years ago. And it's like, well, actually, these guys stand still for me so that I can collect the pollen, which is a really good protein source. So that was when vegetarian bees started to develop. And so they now, what makes a bee a bee, is that they collect pollen as the protein source to feed their offspring. This is a bee grub, and this is a pollen patty that a bee has provided for her it to, um, to eat and develop. So we need a pollination vector, wind, water, or an insect, in order for plants to reproduce, because they can't mate like us. We, they can't move around and find a mate. They need somebody to help them get the male gamete to another female gamete. So that's what the bees do best. So because bees actively collect pollen to provide for their young, they have to be efficient at what they do. It's like we go out shopping for the family, we go to the grocery store because we want fruit and vegetables. We go up and down, aisle one, aisle two, aisle three. We don't go, oh, we go to the um, the grocery store and then we'll go to the vegetable store and then we'll come back to the grocery store and then we'll go aisle four and then we'll go aisle five. Um, we go up and down and so this is what the bees do as well. This is a strawberry flower and it's made, it's made up of lots and lots of simple flowers. All of these are single flowers and they are compatible. They will, they will pollinate within that large flower. So because the bee is going to collect the pollen and the nectar to provide for its young. She's going to work that whole flower until there is no pollen, and then she'll move on. And she carries that, so she straddles it off, and she packs it into some hairs underneath her abdomen. And that she's carrying that as she goes and, and forages. And as she moves around the flower, the, the pollen that's kept underneath her abdomen in those hairs, the grains are easily transferred from one flower to another. This is a homolictus, this is a little na native bee, about five millimetres long. And underneath, she's got yellow 
and that's the pollen. And she's moved all over that flower, pollinating every single one of those simple flowers. We have other pollinators, apart from bees, we have other insect pollinators. Um, we have wasps, hoverflies, rubber flies, beetles, ants, and they visit flowers so that they can do the other jobs that they do. So we've got wasps, this is a hunter. So she hunts to provide food for her offspring. She hunts other insects. And this is pretty hard work. So she goes and visits a flower to drink nectar, to get a sugary hit, to give her the energy to go and hunt. So insect Gatorade is nectar. So all of these insects are potential pollinators because they visit the flowers to collect nectar to give them the energy to do the other jobs. But what they do, so this is an ant. This little ant comes into the uh, strawberry flower because she's been really busy all morning and she's come and she's drinking a bit of nectar from this flower, this flower, this flower, this flower. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, I feel I'm energised now. I'm off to do what I need to do. And none of these flowers got visited. So these seeds have developed and these ones haven't. That's where you get evolved fruit. Here we have that little homolictus that moves over that whole flower, transferring pollen from one flower to another. All of those ovules were fertilised, all of those seeds have developed and they all produce a hormone to stimulate fruit tissue growth. This is why pollination is so important for crop quality and yield. It is also incredibly important for biodiversity. So our native bees have evolved with our native flowering plants. They know how to collect the pollen and the nectar going via the reproductive parts of the flower. So for example, pea flowers, they have to step on the keel of the pea flower to open up and have the anthers flip out underneath She'll scrabble the pollen off and then she'll feed them off the nectar. And she does that to each flower. And the hair, hairs underneath can, uh, hold the pollen that she's, she's collecting. And so every time she visits a flower, they get pollinated with the hair that's, with the pollen that she's holding underneath her abdomen. Honeybees go around the back, bite a hole in the nectary, steal the um, nectar and bypass the reproductive parts of the flower. And they do that with a lot of our native flowering plants. So they actually disrupt the, the whole mechanism of, of pollination within a lot of our native flowering plants. So native bees are really important for crops and for biodiversity. The other thing that makes a bee a bee is the fact they have these branched hairs. So over these million years that they have been evolving with plants, they need to be really effective at collecting this pollen. So we've got lots of hairy wasps, we've got lots of hairy flies, but they're hair like ours, a single strand like that. The bees have evolved that their hairs have now split into branches, which has increased the surface area of those hairs. They're already a hairy insect. And then to increase the surface area of the, the whole insect because of the branches on their head, then adding to the fact that they they, as they fly through the air, they build up an electrostatic charge. And so they scrabble this dry, light pollen, and it's actually drawn to their body um, just through physics. Here we have a Tetragonula carbonaria. This, you, you, most of you would have seen little black stingless bees. They're not hairy. They really are and hairy enough to, to have that... Um, that pollen attracted to their body, then what they do is they've got pair, special brushes on their legs and they'll brush all that pollen off and they'll pack it into their, um, their pollen baskets. And so with social bees, they have these special structures and that's a pollen basket on their hind leg. Because they're a social bee, they have a community that they need to feed. It's not just one baby. They have thousands of offspring to feed. And so the foragers go out there to feed the whole community. So there's no point just taking a little purse with you. Uh, you've got to take some big shopping bags if you're going to feed a big family. So this is what they are. These are shopping bags. And what they do is they, as the, they scrabble the pollen and it collects on their body and then they comb it off and they pack it into these pollen baskets. 
but there's nothing much to them except they're an indent. And so she has to regurgitate a little bit of nectar to mix with that dry pollen. And she does that so that she can pack it into layers. And you can see the layers in this pollen uh, patty or pollen pellet. And that's what they do, packs it into layers. You couldn't pack that much pollen into that leg if it was dry. So once she's added a bit of nectar to it, that is no longer available for pollination. These cannot help pollinate a plant, a flower. And this is a stingless bee, as she's the same. It's only the incidental bits of pollen that are left on the body in between grooming. These bits here. So as she's moving around the flowers, it's this that is the most important for pollination. This isn't available. Solitary bees, on the other hand, they rear one individual offspring at a time. So they don't have to have these great big shopping baskets. They have what's called scopal hairs. These are megachyle species. This is a leaf cutter bee and this is a resin bee. And you'll see they're bristly hairs underneath the abdomen. She packs the pollen that she collects off her body. She scrubs off her body and she packs it into these hairs starting from the tip until the whole scopal area is built. And here we have a, a resin bee. It's not a yellow belly resin bee. It's a resin bee that's packed her scopal hairs full of yellow pollen. This pollen is dry. She doesn't have to add any nectar to it. So when you think about the amount of dry pollen grains that are contained on her under her abdomen, that's thousands and thousands of them, and, and they're available as she moves over the flower to be transferred from one flower to another. So with this, with the social bees, honeybees and stingless bees, they're fantastic for crop pollination because you can get a box and that's filled with thousands of workers and hundreds of thousands of those workers are foraging. And what they do is they go out and they find a good resource like your macadamia crop and they go back and say to their buddies, hey, some really good pucker out here and they recruit their nest nut mates so they can go out in mass when they find a, um, a really good floral resource. However, Individually, they've only got a few dozen pollen grains on them at the time. This is a Leoproctus. This is dry pollen inside her legs, under her abdomen, and this is the reproductive part of this flower. This is a Gibum, uh, a Pasunia. And so you can just imagine how many pollen grains could be easily deposited onto that sticky stigmatic surface. And then she'll go to another flower and cross-pollinate that and cross-pollinate that. So individually, our solitary bees are much better pollinators than our social bees. But our social bees, we can get out there in large numbers, and so they're a really good manageable um, pollinator, especially for crops. So as a bit of a summary, we've got 20, over 20,000 bees in the world. Apis mellifera is just one of them. We've got 1,600 species of native bee in Australia. Any area, any 100 kilometer radius area should contain 200 to 250 species of bee. They overlap, so they're not all different, but there, there is biodiversity in our areas if we can <coughs> build up those populations. Of the 1,600 species, only 11 of them are social, and they're our stingless bees, and they're manageable. Most of them are solitary or semi-social. The so solitary bees don't store honey, so we're not, we're not encouraging solitary bees in order to get honey. They are incredibly important pollinators, though, and for biodiversity, they are absolutely necessary. This is a little Leoproctus bee, and just some diversity there. So, Solitary bees are a single reproductive, we've got males, but once she's mated, she's a single reproductive female. All female solitary bees are capable of mating and reproducing offspring. They live in an isolated nest, and sometimes they live in aggregations, which is lots and lots of nests altogether. 
they complete their life cycle all alone. Unlike the social bees, they work as a community. The queen's the only one that makes and lays the viable eggs. She lays the worker eggs. The workers do thousands and thousands of workers in a honeybee and a stingless bee colony. But all the females are sterile, they cannot reproduce. Then seasonally drones are produced, which are the males, and um, they, they, they do what they do, and that's all they do. Um, and so the queen can't live without the colony because she can't go out and forage and feed herself. And the colony can't live without the queen because if she dies, there's nobody to do the egg laying and replace the worker. So the colony as a super organism will die out. This is an Ostoplevia australis queen on her cluster of brood and her workers. So these are social bees, it's Ostoplevia australis. They go out and they shop together. So they've all got their pollen baskets full. We've got some that have got their gut full of nectar. They go into the hive and they unpack their groceries and they value add the nectar by dehydrating it into honey. And then they mix the honey and the, and the pollen together and they make it into a food provision for the queen to lay an egg on top. Once she's done that, she'll seal that up and about 55 to 60 days later, a young adult will emerge. This is called a callow. Callows in, uh, in honeybees as well. And they're a lighter colour, and they're that light colour for about a week until their exoskeleton hardens and gets black. So honeybees are our most recognised bees. People go, oh, I love bees. I love bees. Talk about bees. Honey, I love honey. But what about the other 1,600? Oh, I had no idea. They're the most researched. They're actually the most researched organism on the planet, apart from man. Um, an individual bee can visit a thousand flowers a day and they will fly usually up to five kilometres. They're not for a really good resource. They'll fly eight kilometres from their nest. So you think about five to eight kilometre radius, it's a hell of an area. So if you're lucky enough to have a crop that is near a feral colony or a, a managed colony, within five kilometres of that, that's free pollination if you've got feral bees in, in your area. So since, two, since 1822, they've covered the whole of the um, country. And there was a study done in Victoria in 1995 and they found that there were between 50 and 150 feral colonies per square kilometre in this particular national park. That's free pollination for anyone who's got crops within a five kilometre radius of those feral colonies. Free pollination. Overseas they don't have that sort of free pollination because they've had, Varroa mite has, um, has infested everywhere in the world except for Australia. And along with Varroa mite and the four Ps, parasites, <coughs> pathogens, pesticides and poor nutrition, which we can bugger up too, but we haven't yet. It's really good that we don't do that. But you add to that mix the varroa mite and you have all your ferals uh, wiped out and also there's a lot of um, difficulties going on in the, in the bee industry and also the pollination, the crops that are reliant upon honeybees for pollination overseas because there is so much going on. So we lose all of our ferals within about four years, and that we would lose a good percentage of our small beekeepers, and some of our larger uh, beekeepers would lose some of their populations. And the thing that does that is that what happens is there'll be viruses within um, a honeybee colony, but a good healthy colony will only have you know 10% of a particular virus. The most worrying virus is the deformed wing virus. And the colonies can cope with these if they've got 10% of their bees that emerge from the cells that have got deformed wings like this, they, they can't fly. But there's lots of them to do, to do in the hive. They can feed the young, they can draw comb, they can dehydrate honey, they can clean, they can do all sorts of stuff. But once Varroa comes into the mix, 
they are a sucker. They suck the Pima lymph from, from the, the bee and they transfer these viruses from one bee to another as they feed. And so if you increase the number of var varroa mites, then you're in danger to increase the number of, of um, emerging bees that have got the virus. And so eventually you'll end up with 95 to 100% of your bees will have these deformed wings. And they can cope until they get to the point where somebody needs to feed them. So if they can't fly, they can't forage and they can't feed the colony. So that's why it takes so long. It can take two to four years for a colony to starve to death. And that's what happens with the, um, with the ferals. Um, so once the ferals are gone, if you're reliant on the feral honeybees, you'll have to look elsewhere for your pollination services. In Australia, so this almond industry in Australia is worth $1 billion a year, and it's growing. Last, uh, 2016, they took 180,000 hives down to the almond orchard. And those hives were not the hives that come from Queensland, they were from Victoria, South Australia and New South Wales. Because the Queenslanders and Northern New South Wales guys are going, it's too expensive, it's too hard, it knocks my bees about, because you know, mid-August, it's pretty darn cold down there, I'm not going to do it. It's worth it for the guys who are closer, but it's not worth it for the Queenslanders. But if you get rid of all the ferals, and then all of your crop growers who are dependent upon insect pollinators for pollination, apple growers, cherry growers, macadamia, your tropical fruits, some of your uh, other uh, fruiting vegetables, they're gonna need those, uh, they're gonna need the managed colonies. So demand is gonna grow, and who's gonna be able to pay for those colonies? The almond industry, because they're, it's big, and they're going. They're uh, estimating that in the next couple of years, they're going to need half a million honeybee colonies taken down to the almond um, orchards in in the south. And that's when the guys up here and in Queensland are going, "Yep, make it look worth my while, and I'll do it." And they will make it worth their while, which means that you guys aren't going to have honeybees to pollinate, manage honeybees to pollinate your crops, and neither are the apple guys, and neither are the tender cock guys. So we need to put something in place. We need to understand our other pollinators. We depend too heavily on our honeybees for pollination of our crops. They're monocrop culture crops and we need to be doing different management strategies so that we can be supporting those bees that are in our environment. So we've got, as I said, we've got 11 uh, species of native stingless bee. We can put them in there, generalist forager. These are the crops that, these, uh, that this project's looking at. This is an Ostroplevia australis. It's a really good pollinator. Um, this is, I've got to speed up because I've only got five minutes. So we looked at Ilpin, uh, which is uh, low, the Blue Mountains. They're a really good apple growing area. It's quite small now compared to Orange. But Ilpin has natural populations of, of stingless bees and they actually found more stingless bees on the apple crops than honeybees, and they, uh, this particular um, area is really close to a national park, so there's feral honeybees and wild um, stingless bees, and the stingless bee populations were really good. They will they'll visit cucurbits. I'm going to go through this. Then we've got our other alternative pollinators. We've got our solitary bees. This is a carpenter bee, and this is a cool climate, Hampton, which is cold, a stingless bee would not forage in these sort of conditions, it's too cold. This is a um, carpenter bee and she's visiting, she's got a really hairy face and just imagine how much pollen she could transfer off her face every time she visits that apple flower. And we had an awesome crop that year. This is fodder crops, blue band of bees on clover. This is a, a, a resin, sorry, a reed bee. This is how she carries her pollen. And when she's going over a cherry flower, she's transferring that, that pollen as she goes. Homolictus, little feathery hairs here. She packs the pollen into there. And she's, she will visit brassica. She'll visit uh, open daisies. I've seen 
seen them on lots of different things. Um, the pollen pants on a lassie blossom <laughs> as they move over the flowers. This is buckwheat, uh, chicory. This is a uh, resin bee. And she, as think of her as she goes over, she's potentially a, a, a loosened pollinator because they love peas. This is also in chicory. So what can we do? We need to provide floral resources. And we're going to be talking about that today because this is what you guys and this project is all about, which I'm excited to look at. Um, this is a great foraging area for the bees in a canola crop for three weeks. Three weeks. There's nothing else after that. And then they put wheat in. So the only thing that's going to keep any of the bees alive is this remnant vegetation. And hopefully some planting. Planting along your, your fence lines, along the driveway, in those areas that you can't farm. But it's, it's, you're probably mowing it anyway. So put some plants in. Um, this is what they're starting to look at in almond orchards in, with Western Sydney University's um, uh, project. So this is brassica and then also using clover. So that when the bees come in, before the crop is really in full bloom, the bees have got food to forage on. It keeps them healthy, then they go to the crop and if they're actually distracted from the crop, they can mow these, uh, these inter-row flowers. Um, but you can also do hedge rows of permanent, more permanent flowering plants or um, large plantings at the end of your row or big shrubs that are, that are oh, long-term flowering plants. So we've got habitat, you would next you see a bee hotel over there and where um, you can, if you've got some dead trees around, drill some holes in it, you know, three to, to uh, 10 millimeter in diameter and as deep as possible and you'll attract all sorts of native bees. Um, I'm not going there. These are tar carpenter bees, they love uh, hollows. These are mast bees. This is just a bit of an idea of the different types of bees. These are resin bees, they live in little hollows, um, I can't go there. Don't go big, don't make them big, go lots and lots of little. We're trying to mimic nature, so get, they'll, they'll nest in small dead limbs. So full sun, because your dead limbs are in full sun, so your bee hotels need to go in full sun as well. We have ground nesting bees, so keep an eye on what's going on. Don't necessarily mulch everything. Um, they, they, they like to nest in the ground. This is an aggregation I talked about. And I think, now pesticides, of course, bees and pesticides don't mix, certainly don't mix for very long. Um, so we need to be doing integrated pest management. Uh, there's somebody who's gonna talk about that here today. If you have to spray, use soft um, sprays, and if you can spray at night, uh, that is also favorable. Know your pests. How am I going? Have I got one more minute? Yeah, you're right. You're all right. <laughs> so we've got, um, Predators, uh, wasps are predators. They're also parasitoids. They'll lay their eggs. There's some that will lay their eggs in pest insects. Um, then we've got uh, our other pollinators, butterflies, bees, fly, uh, flies, wasps, ants. So you just need to go out there and look at your insects. Check out what you've got. This is a wasp. It's hunting, and that's, that's a white cabbage butterfly caterpillar. So it's a beneficial insect, another um, type of native wasp. These are lace wings. So if you see these anywhere, this is the eggs of a lace wing. And the nymph is a predator and also this, the adult is a predator of soft body um, insect pests. Ladybirds, this is what their nymph looks like. Ugly as, only a mother could love it. But they're a goody, so don't get rid of those. Assassin bugs, they're a really good predator. Don't pick them up, they hurt like anything. Long-legged flies, they're a predator as well. Cute little fly. Um, Robber flies, damsel flies. This little wasp, tiny, two millimetres long, lays its eggs in caterpillars, and then when the um, egg hatches, the larvae 